The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar being co-sponsored by the Central Ohio APWA and the Ohio LTAP Center. We are very pleased to have you as a part of our audience for the webinar. Uh, this is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I have with me Gary Browning, who will be speaking to you later on. Um, he is from the city of Dublin. So a couple of quick housekeeping items, and then we're going to go ahead and move right into the presentation contents. Um, first off, we are attempting to record the webinar. So if we are successful, you'll get a link to that recording afterwards. If we're not successful, it's a good thing you're here, so you can hear it live and in person. Um, we appreciate you being a part of the webinar audience. Um, the next thing is on the next screen, I'm going to share with you a Mentimeter code because we are going to be using Menti to do some real-time audience polling. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and load that up, menti.com, put the code in, or you can use your smartphone to just scan the QR code, and it should take you straight to our poll. Um, Last but not least, we also want to encourage questions. So if you would like to ask questions, there is a question box in the GoToWebinar um, panel. Please feel free to put your question in any time, and we are going to work on addressing those when we each get to the end of our respective um, presentation sections. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and move us into our first polling question, and the Menti code is still going to be on the top of the screen. It's six. Three one five seven eight nine nine, um, and what we'd like to know is what type of agency are you from? So if you could go ahead and put your response in, that's great. It's going to share the responses in real time, and on the bottom right-hand corner, it lets us know how many people have responded. So um, right now we have about seventy-six participants on the webinar, and. Um, and one person threw it in the question box, so we'll add one more to the county list. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, if you don't want to do the mentee responding in the question box, it's just great too. So and it looks like we're um, moving along pretty good with people responding. Yep, we have two people from the counties who responded in the question box. That's great. Well, we're glad to see a good mix of folks, um, you know, especially those who have an interest in getting a CDL program started for your agency because we know there's been changes and what has to happen for someone with their training with the CDL licenses. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, what happened is that on February 7th of 2022, which is a little over a year ago now, there were changes concerning training that went to effect. Um, and this is for folks who are first time license holders, class A, class B, or if they're upgrading from an existing B to an A, um, these were changes that were put in place. And what happened is that they um, decided that they were going to standardize the training that was required, they meaning um, the federal motor carriers. So there's now theory training that has to be taken and behind the wheel training that has to be taken. And you'll see there's names down there at the bottom with little arrows pointing up. And what we want to share is that through Ohio LTAP, you can get that theory training through our e-learning system. And I'm going to talk to you about that today. Um, and then your agency actually could do the behind the wheel portion. And I'm going to talk to you about that some, and then um, we're also going to have um, you know more about that from Gary that he's going to discuss on how the city of Dublin has done it there. So with that information, I'm going to go ahead and launch into the um, why. And they basically um, wanted to put in place a standard to make sure that, you know, the CDL drivers were highly qualified and they felt in the past that not everyone was getting the same type of training on the same topics, you know, for um, and being as comprehensive as what they felt needed to happen. So that's why they went with these uniform requirements. Now, really, I mean, when they were looking at this, they weren't looking at folks who were driving a snowplow. They were more looking at the over-the-road drivers who were driving the semis. 
but because our drivers have to have a CDL as well in order to drive snowplow trucks, you know, we got caught in the, the changes and we've got to live with them. So what we're trying to do is make sure that you understand um, how you can do this for your agency. So with this webinar, we're going to talk first about the federal requirements versus some state requirements, because I found as we were setting up our training program that there were a lot of questions out there. Um, and one of the questions um, was, you know, why is it that some programs seem to have different um, standards than others as far as amounts of training? And I'll get into that in a minute, but I did want to share with you that a big partner in the training that we're offering is the Clear Roads program. And later in the presentation, I'm going to give you a link to their web page. Um, but Clear Roads, what it is, it's, it's a program where a group of um, state DOTs has gotten together and pooled their money. It's called a pooled fund. They pooled their money um, and create resources that can help you with your snow and ice removal program. And one of the resources they created was the CDL training. They actually took what the federal regulations, these new regulations were, and created training that would meet those guidelines. Um, so our LTAP training and what you can do with your agency, you know, and you can tap the Clear Roads materials, um, is based on the federal law. And it's not based on the state of Ohio law because, you know, unless you decide you want to open up a shop and start being a, a for-profit training provider, you're really only training folks who work for you or you've hired to work for you and you're not charging for it. So because of that, we're not covered under what the state of Ohio's requirements are for CDL training. Their requirements are for the schools that are collecting fees from individuals to attend and receive CDL training. And some of those um, differences in what we have to do under the federal laws is what I'm going to cover here in the next few screens because these are a lot of the questions we've gotten. Um, federal training, there's no minimum required hours, whereas the state of Ohio um, regulations regarding CDL training. And again, the regulations are strictly for the for-profit providers, um, places that are collecting money from their students. Um, you know, they do have a minimum number of hours. Also, you know, when you look at the theory training, you know, the federal guidelines do not have a minimum number of questions on that training, whereas the state of Ohio does have a minimum number of questions. Um, also, the federal guidelines don't require that online training, the theory training online, be proctored, whereas with the state of Ohio, the online testing for theory has to be proctored. So, you know, that's why we can offer our theory training through LTAP and, you know, let people take it at your agency, you know, on their own time, um, you know, that you don't have to proctor them when they're taking the exam. We're still meeting the federal law, um, you know, because we're not charging anyone for our theory training. Um, with the theory and the behind the wheel training, there are some guidelines you've got to be careful of if you decide to do this at your agency. Both parts, the theory and the behind the wheel, have to be completed within a year of being started. Um, also, you don't have to take the theory training and the behind the wheel training from the same provider, meaning, you know, you can utilize the online LTAP e-learning modules and have them take the theory training through us. And then you could have a behind the wheel training program at your agency um, that you're offering. So with the behind the wheel though, there's two sections in that. There's what they call the range and then the road. And the range is where you take them out in an area, kind of like a parking lot or um, a yard and train them how to operate the, the truck before you actually take them on the road. And then once they are proficient at that, then you can move over to the road section. Those two pieces do have to be by the same training provider. So, you know, behind the wheel, both range and road, same training provider, but the theory and the behind the wheel can be different providers. So, 
The theory training, they don't actually have to complete that before they obtain their learner's permit. Um, and they don't even have to complete it before they start the behind the wheel. But in order for you to put the behind the wheel um, portion in the Federal Motor Carrier's website saying that they've passed it, then they do have to have the theory training completed first. So, you know, it makes sense for people to do the theory training first. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the book you get at the BMV when you're first getting your driver's license to get your learner's permit. I would see, you know, people, you know, getting a lot of benefit out of doing the theory training before they actually went in to get their learner's permit. They don't have to, but if it was me, I would do it. <laughs> so, um, but just know that, you know, if they get it a little out of order, you know, they don't have to have had it in any certain order, except when you get down to the very end, when you're putting in the behind the wheel completion, the theory completion already does have to be in the federal motor carrier system. And don't stress about that yet. Um, Gary's gonna talk to you quite a bit about the federal motor carrier system when we get to his portion of it. Um, so, I'm gonna check real quick, see if there's any questions that's come into the question box. Um, there was a question about getting a copy of the presentation. We, I didn't mention that, but yes, Claudia will definitely send a copy of the presentation out after we've completed the webinar today. Um, don't worry about that. All right, so class A CDL requirements. Um, in our e-learning through LTAP, there are 30 different topics and we broke them out and followed the way that the Clear Roads had it set up. They're covered in 30 different online training modules and we've timed them out. The modules are approximately 28 and a half hours of training. Most of the modules are about an hour in length and when they get to the end after they've completed those 30 modules, then they do have to take a post test and pass with a score of 80% or higher. Um, they aren't required to pass on the first time. If they don't pass the first time, they could unenroll and re-enroll and take it again. Um, there's no limit on the number of times um, that, you know, they can take the test. So if anybody has test anxiety, that hopefully that'll help them out, um, knowing that there's no, you know, have to pass on the first time deal, they can take it again if they need to. We do have a bank of questions, so they aren't necessarily going to get the same questions when they retake it. Um, the bank of questions randomizes what they get, but it is covered, covering what the topics are. So if you have anybody who's struggling, they can always go back and retake the modules. Um, that's The modules are there to help them. For the upgrade from the class B to A, there's actually only 22 topics that have to be covered. And when we send out the follow-up email for this webinar, we'll make sure to send you um, the guide that we have that lists all the topics, just so you have it too. Um, it's 21 hours of training, and most of them are about an hour in length with an 80% or higher score needed on the final test. So, Class B CDL, that requires 29 different topics um, and it's covered in the 29 modules that we have available. It's only 27 and a half hours of training versus 28 and a half hours of training. Um, so to me, I mean, I, unless you really just want them to get the Class B instead of the Class A, it, it almost makes sense just to do the extra hour and get the Class A CDL. Um, also, they have to have that 80% or higher score. So these things I'm going to talk about next apply to all three of the curriculums, the A, B, and the upgrade from the B to the A. When they go to take the test, they are going to have to, on a screen before they get started, give us their name, and they do have to give us their driver's license number and the state that issued it and their birth date. I know I don't have that on the screen here, but it is a requirement as well. Um, if they don't give us that information, then they're not going to be able to take the test. Um, and the way, why reason we do that is that's the information we have to have in order to put their passage into the Federal Motor Carrier System to say that they completed the training. 
They also have to agree on one of the screens to allow us to transfer that information to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. So if they don't want to give us that information or they refuse to let us transfer it, then the system just won't let them take the test. So I would, if I had someone, you know, starting to work for me that we were going to put through this training program, I would make sure they know up front that they had to do that because it, it would really not be a good thing to get down to the end of them having taken all that training and then for them to say, nope, I don't want to do that or agree to that. So wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. All right. So for those of you who are thinking about utilizing the theory training, which type of license do you feel that your employees would um, be taking the training for? So again, this is the Mentimeter. Appreciate the responses. It's pretty even right now. So another question that came out of the question box was asking, will the, there be questions after each module or when you complete the 28 and a half hours? We do have ungraded um, questions like knowledge checks in the modules. And, you know, that's to help people out kind of gauge where they are with their learning. Um, and then when they're completely finished, that's when they have to take the test. So we do try to help them out, do knowledge checks throughout. And then, um, you know, at the very end, they do have to have that separate test that that's where they have to get 80% or higher. And in the chat, someone also put in um, CDLA and someone else put in the upgrade from the B to the A. So thank you for your responses. It's good to see um, what it is that everybody's thinking about or planning for. All right, so let's talk some about the behind the wheel training requirements. If you want to do this, then you're going to need to be a registered training provider on the Federal Motor Carriers Registry. And Gary's going to talk to you quite a bit about that portion, show you the screens and things that you have to fill out, talk to you about how he's set this all up for Dublin. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, you know, is that, and it's going to seem kind of different because we all, for the most part, are in public sector agencies, but you're going to need to list yourself as a private training provider. Um, and this is because you're not going to be offering your training out for people to publicly register and take. And it's, it's going to seem different because, like I said, we're all used to being public sector agencies. But, you know, we're not saying that, you know, anyone off the street can come and register and take CDL training with us or you wouldn't be through your agency. So you'll list yourself as a, a private training provider. Um, and it is your agency that's going to be listed, not your specific instructors. So the when you do set this up, don't worry about um, having to list specific instructors. You won't have to do that. Um, we have another question that's come into the chat. It says, do we need to be registered if they are only completing the online portion through LTAP? No. If you're not going to do the behind the wheel portion at your agency, if you're going to have them do theory through us and then have them go out somewhere to take the training, then you don't have to worry about registering as a training provider. Um, but if you do want to just do want to offer the behind the wheel through your agency and that I'm going to talk to you about those requirements. Um, one of the things is before you submit their actual completion of the behind the wheel, then you're going to have to verify that the theory training was completed and submitted. Um, and this is something that if you get in there and you know that they took it through us and that we submitted it, you know, we normally, I normally, I'm the one that actually submits it and I try to do it on an almost daily basis. I usually do it at lunchtime so I don't forget about it. Um, if you're not seeing the person's theory in the system, you know, call me to make sure that I didn't mistype maybe one of the characters in their name, get it transposed or, or miss, you know, transpose a, a number or a letter in their driver's license number. And then if that we know for certain it's in there the way it needs to be, then um, I would reach out to the Federal Motor Carriers Help Desk. We actually had this situation with the city of Toledo where something when the city of Toledo signed up to be a behind the wheel training provider, 
um, wasn't set up quite right on the Federal Motor Carrier side and it made it so they couldn't see the people that we were submitting um, and their theory completions. And we were able to work through after a few emails back and forth and get that fixed so Toledo could see everyone who had been submitted. So um, what happens is once the theory training completion submitted and the behind the wheel submitted, then the person can actually register to take the exam the in-person exam and the state driver's licensing agency is going to verify that that behind the wheel training was completed. Um, so, you know, if the two training completions have to be in there before they can register, because if not, um, they won't be able to sign up to take the in-person test. So some items about the behind the wheel requirements they need to complete the training um, and the testing and the type of same type of vehicle. So if they're going to be, you know, driving the snowplow truck, then that's what the training needs to be completed in. Um, and take a look at your fleet, because if you have vehicles that are not automatic transmissions, then you need, and that person's going to be required to drive either or, then you need to make sure that they um, are taking it in a standard or taking doing training in the standard transmission um, because if they only do their training in an automatic transmission vehicle and then they get down and take the test in the automatic transmission vehicle, then there's going to be a restriction put on their CDL license. They call it an e-restriction. So make sure you're looking at your fleet. And if you have standards, make sure that you train them in that so they can drive either or. I think when I was growing up, we used to call it a stick. So um, a big part of the behind the wheel training requirements is what they call goal. And it's get out and look. So that's a major theme in the training. And I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. So they do need to be comfortable and make sure that they focus on that. Um, in the range area, which is really the first part of the training, um, they need to be, you know, in an area without any traffic or any other vehicles. Um, and I really recommend utilizing the training materials that are provided by the Clear Roads Pooled Fund. Those materials are free for any public agency. You don't have to be at a state DOT. Township, county, city, village, you guys, all you have to do is send a request in and they'll give you full access to everything that's there. Um, there are no minimum number of hours that they have to be behind the wheel, but your instructor needs to document the hours that are being completed um, and document their progress. And when they finally get to the point where the instructor feels that they're proficient. And one of the nice thing about the Clear Roads materials is they actually give you check sheets to do this with. So if I was going to be, um, you know, training folks on behind the wheel as their instructor, I just set up a little binder for each check sheet um, for that person and put multiple copies of the check sheets in there. So I could, you know, if today was one day we were going out, I'd put today's date and then I'd put my notes about each type of activity they were doing in the truck that I was training them on. So, and then the next day, you know, that I took them out, I would go ahead and, you know, use a new sheet in that same section and, and show the progress until I got down to showing the proficiency. There's a, another question that's come in. It says, once all training is complete and submitted to the training provider registry, does the person seeking a CDL need to take a certificate of any kind of the CDL testing site? Um, or will a certificate need to be emailed over ahead of testing? No, they have taken all of this certificate requirements and, you know, put that to, to bed basically through this training registry system. What happens is once the theory training is in the um, Federal Motor Carrier System and then the behind the wheel training is listed as complete in there, the, the BMV actually can get right in and see those records. So there's no need to take anything with them for the um, CDL testing. It's all been electronically documented. So good question. 
Um, let's see, there was also another question that came in. Do you offer a template for tracking hours? Yep, that, I was just talking about that, so good question there. The template comes through the Clear Roads um, program, and like I said, uh, they're great sheets, the check sheets, and I would just set up a binder with check sheets for each all the check sheets that were in there have each check sheet have its own little section and then use that to do all the documentation and then when I was completely done and the there behind the wheel um, training had been submitted to Federal Motor Carriers I'd take those check sheets and like scan them in and keep them because if there are any questions or you end up getting on the list to be audited as a training provider from Federal Motor Carriers, then you can pull it out and say, look, here's all of our sheets from all the different days the instructor took them out, and you can show where the instructor documented their progress each day. So the road part, once they've gotten proficient on the range, they can go to the road, and it says specifically that the instructor has to engage in two-way active communication. So they want to make sure that that instructor is, you know, talking to the person they're training um, and that, you know, during those times, the person who is learning can only count time that they are actually driving. So I know sometimes, you know, I've seen where we'll get one of the, at least at ODOT, one of the, I believe they call them the TAN, tandem trucks extended cabs anyway um, and they might take three people out at a time to do training on the road well if you're in the back seat and you're not driving that time does not count for you you need to be the person who's actually driving for the time to count um, and then the instructor does have to be in that two-way active communication with the, the trainee during that time no more questions over there on that side. Okay, we're going to go on to the next slide. Um, they, the in person who's learning has to always be with the CDL instructor, has to have that CDL instructor with them in the vehicle at all times. Um, and again, no minimum number of hours because we are following the federal laws. Um, but they do have to demonstrate proficiency in all areas. And I talked about this extensively on the the range portion, but use those check sheets to document the hours and then the time that the person um, is spending and, and, you know, document what they've done good, what they still need to work on to get to proficiency. Question that's come in, uh, when a trainee gets their class A CDL permit, does a CDL license driver riding with him or her have to have the equal license? Yes. If they're going to be training someone to get a Class A CDL, then they have to have a Class A CDL as well. And I'm going to talk a bit more about your instructors here. Um, topics that do have to be covered, um, but no requirement to be driven during the behind the wheel portion. Um, hazard perception, um, railroad, highway grade crossings, night operation, extreme driving conditions, um, and the skid control recovery, and, and you can kind of see why they didn't require you to actually have them drive these conditions, because, you know, definitely you wouldn't want to, um, you know, try to recreate some of these and take a brand new um, person with their learner's permit out there, you know, extreme driving conditions, but they do still, the person who's instructing them has to cover the topics and talk about how to deal with those. Um, someone has asked, how do you obtain the clear road sheets? I am going to give you that information in a few slides, so just hang tight and I will get you that. So your instructors do have to cover all the topics listed um, and quote, determine and document that each driver trainee has demonstrated proficiency. So um, again, those sheets that I mentioned, they've got the topics listed. They're a great tool for the instructor to follow. There is no testing out of the skills on either the range or the road. So they do have to actually demonstrate proficiency in those um, skills that are listed. And the behind the wheel training has to really be behind the wheel. It's got to be live. No simulators are allowed. Um, you know, and again, the vehicle, and I mentioned this before, it needs to be the same type of vehicle that they're going to be driving and that they are trying to get the license or the endorsement for. 
So just make sure that you've worked that out ahead of time, looked at your fleet, made sure you've got them in the right type of vehicle. Here's the part about the instructors. So they have to hold the same type of CDL, um, same class or higher, with all the same endorsements. And then they have to meet all the applicable state requirements for being a commercial motor vehicle instructor. So they have to have a minimum of two years of op experience in operating a vehicle, um, a commercial motor carrier vehicle, meaning, you know, in our cases, the um, snowplow trucks um, requiring a CDL the same or higher or have a two minimum of two years experience as a behind the wheel CMV instructor. So in this case, it's going to be probably the top bullet because the behind the wheel requirements really haven't been in place yet for two years. Another question that's come in, if a person is upgrading from a class B to an A, they have a learner's permit for a class A, is their original class B void? Um, you know, that's a great question and I do not know the answer to that. Um, but I will get the answer and make sure it goes out on the email in the follow-up um, that goes out to everybody who's on the webinar. So, Jesse, please look for the answer to that question in the follow-up email. I'll make sure that um, you get the answer to that. All right, moving on. Our LTAP theory training is available to anybody who would like to take it. It's out there 24-7, 365. Um, you know, it's available, you know, action, nationwide, globally. Um, you don't have to be in Ohio to use it, um, you know, just so you're aware. And I, we'll send out the instruction sheet on how to get people signed up to get the um, My ODA account, which is the account you use to log in, but it's all free. So next steps, if you are interested in getting your um, behind the wheel training program started, um, you know, I would talk with your licensed experienced drivers and see are they interested in, you know, being an instructor, being in the, the truck with someone who's a new driver um, and helping them learn everything they need to know. And again, the Materials from Clear Roads, which I'll be giving you a link to, can be utilized for this behind the wheel road and range. And before I talk to the folks who already have the licenses that you think would make good instructors, um, I'd print the materials from Clear Roads out so they know what it is they're going to have to work with. Another question that's come in, can the student ride with a class A CDL holder with less than two years of driving experience? No, I mean, the it's very clear in the regulations that came from the feds that in order for the person to be um, considered the instructor, they have to have a minimum of two years experience. Now, if you just want to have them go out and ride with somebody and not count it towards their training requirement, um, you know, you could still have them go out and ride with someone, but you're just not going to be able to have that person, you know, sign off on the sheets or, or document any type of, you know, achievement towards proficiency. Another question that's come in is, can I, as the certified trainer, appoint an experienced CDL driver to ride along for the over-the-road training, or do I have to ride every second with the trainee? You know, if I was going to look at um, having another experienced CDL driver ride along with them, I would look at having that person uh, make sure they meet the requirements of being an instructor and just have them be an instructor as well. So, you know, it, that way, you know, there's no question about whether or not the person who's getting the training was with an instructor or not. All right, so here's the link and you'll be getting a, a follow up to this um, webinar and the, all the slide copies, but you know, the clear road materials are available. They did a great job setting these up to be very user friendly, which is something I was just really excited about when I saw them. So um, we'll be making sure to send you this link. And while Gary is talking here in a few minutes, I'll make sure to drop the link in the chat box too for you. All right, and someone has asked, they wanted to know where can they find if they've completed the theory 
portion with LTAP. It's going to be in the Federal Motor Carriers um, website, the training registry area, and Gary's going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so he'll show you where that's at. Um, so another question. So individual trainers employees don't need to register. Just the employer needs to be registered. Correct. Yes, that is correct. It's just the employer who needs to be registered. All right, I'm going to move on to our next slide. Um, I want to know what questions do you have about theory training? Type them in. Um, someone actually put a, a question here in the box. Is how many hours do you recommend for range and road training? You know, I'm not um, overseeing any range and road training, so I don't feel like that's a question I can answer, but I will um, ask Gary to answer that when he starts his portion of it, the webinar. Well, maybe you guys have been dropping your questions about the theory training already in the, the ch question box, which is great. Um, okay, fair enough. We're going to keep moving then. If there aren't any questions currently, you can continue to use the question box definitely. So, Gary, I'm going to work on turning things over so you can control the screen on your end. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Victoria, for that portion of the presentation is very informative and I appreciate everything that LTAP provides and everything that they have provided to us in every area of training, including the CDL and ELDT. Um, for a lot of us in communities and uh, everyone listening, I'm sure we probably all had previous training programs that we had in place. And now with the new guidelines, we're wondering, were we doing things correctly? Are we still doing things correctly? And it just kind of leaves us in a little bit of a a confusing state and I know I felt this way when I originally started going through this for the city of Dublin. One thing I want to encourage everyone to do is take advantage of the LTAP resources, take advantage of the clear roads resources. Um, you don't have to create everything from scratch on your own. Uh, I did some things in the very beginning but definitely take advantage of all these things that are available to you it's it's greatly greatly helpful also i want to encourage you and let you know that what you were previously doing more than 99 percent if not a hundred percent of you you're still doing everything that's correctly the only thing we have is just a few small things that we need to add with that said we're going to get into the registration process for the driver's training portal and this will get you in where you're able to log everything with the ELDT. So there's three easy steps that we're going to get involved with. Let me. So number one, we're going to get into creating a login.gov account. We're going to register ourselves as a training provider, and then we're going to register our training locations. All right. So step number one, create your account. <clears throat> so when all of these links will be added to the recording so that you can access this at another time if you have not already done these things. But when you go into the ELDT website through federal, federal Motor Carrier, you're gonna see the steps to be able to create your account. And you're first gonna to have to go in to create a login.gov account. Um, when you go in to create this, uh, it's a very simple process that you'll put your information in. And whoever is going to be representing your agency, Rather, it's um, a superintendent, a supervisor, whoever you deem to be the administrator, if you will, over the ELDT account. This will be the person that is mainly uh, going to go through all of these steps. Now, at a later time in the training process or setting up the ELDT, you can appoint new users or additional users to the system uh, just to make things more simple for, for your organization. But at this point in time, it's going to be the one person who's set up as the primary administrator. Um, and when you set up your login.gov, every time that you log in into ELDT, you're going to be logging into this um, for safety and uh, credibility. They, they use the two-factor uh, authentication. So you'll be able to set up your cell phone or some other uh, choice that you can use to be able to get that authentication when you do log in. Uh, personally, I set up my cell phone. Every time I log in, it then sends a message to my phone that I can validate the credentials and be able to get into the system. So after we've got our login.gov uh, taken care of, now we're going to register our training provider. We're going to register ourselves. 
Uh, so just as I was saying, one representative from each training provider will complete this online portion. Um, they're going to add their name, the name of the organization, the contact information, uh, and they'll put all this into that uh, system. After submitting all the information and accepting the training provider registry terms and conditions, they will then be placed into review. Uh, once the review and the request has went through its portion, uh, you will then get the information that you will need to be able to continue moving forward in that process. Step number three. So now we're going to go in and we're going to register our training locations. Uh, this to me was a little bit confusing in the beginning because as a city, I was thinking of the places that we would typically have our trainings take place. Uh, we may do some training here at our service complex. We may move around the city and utilize some of our park areas uh, to be able to go into the larger parking lots. Um, what I had to kind of dial that back and realize is that registering locations and having multiple locations may be more set for the larger entities like maybe the state or even those private companies who may have an office where they're training in different cities or training in different states. And so they're going to have to register each location as its own area and the training that's provided at those locations. So for us as a city, I was just able to register our service complex as our uh, training location and then provide the information that we're providing that, that we're going to be teaching here. So when we're adding our location, our training providers, or as a training provider, we must type in, you know, put in the type of location that we have. Um, we're validating that we meet the criteria behind a facility or a location able to provide that training, having enough area um, as far as the behind the wheel portion on the range to be able to um, function with maneuverability and those things that are that are identified as everyone previously did who was already uh, you know, conducting their CDL training. Um, you're going to put in the, you see the name and location, contact information. You're going to put in rather your enrollment as public or private enrollment. Uh, Victoria talked about this. I, this is something that was completely backward. And, and I know for us to think of ourselves as public entities, this is the one place that we absolutely want to make sure that we list ourselves as private. Um, if not, it's going to put you on their database as a provider that every everybody out there in the world could contact you if you are the closest closest person listed to them. So make sure that when you list your, uh, your locations that you list yourself as private. Um, also the types of training that's provided and the average number of training hours, uh, average training cost. So for us as municipal workers, uh, you know, local government, the type of training that we're going to provide at our location is going to be dependent upon how we want our program to function. Uh, if you want to utilize LTAP's uh, experience and the opportunity that they have provided us for theory, um, then you can list yourself as being a behind the wheel range and road provider, private provider, um, because you're going to want to fall, you know, utilize the LTAP for their, their experiences and the things that they have. If you want to be able to do theory in-house and do the behind the wheel portion, then you'll just state that in that that part of the documentation. Um, when I did ours here, I listed us, uh, this listed the city of Dublin as providing the in-house theory, the behind the wheel road and range. Uh, names of agencies provided oversight accreditation to the training provider and which contact information would you like publicly displayed on the registry? Um, those things are just basic information as far as falling, falling back on you know, who you are, being the city, the state, the county, the township, uh, and just putting that information in. So it's going to ask when you go through the portion of talking about being a training provider and what type of location do we have? Um, Federal Motor Carrier, the ELDT, they have a lot of these guidelines that you can kind of go through. But if you look at where I have the arrow placed, nearly 100% of us, this is where we're going to fall in at. We're going to fall in as an in-person training regular. Um, this is what we're going to be conducting training at a location that we own or we operate. Uh, we're going to be doing this training in person, in person training regularly. And due to that, we must provide the physical address or mailing address of the location. So there again, as I registered the service complex, I put those information in or put that information in as an in person training regular. 
when you get to go back through and review this uh, presentation, you'll be able to see this hyperlink here that ELDT has placed that walks you through a complete tutorial uh, and it makes it very simple to kind of walk through the processes and the steps. All right, so as we get into some of the ELDT guidelines, as Victoria said, you know, one of the main purposes of doing this uh, was to make sure that we have standardized training being provided to all of our employees um, or all of our trainees, for that matter, for our departments uh, in our organizations. And they've identified a curriculum that goes based with the theory and the behind the wheel reins and the behind the wheel road portions. Um, chances are, if you were already doing your in-house training previous to uh, the new mandate, you were already covering all of these things because if you were utilizing the state of Ohio CDO manual, the CDO manual was already taking you through all of these uh, different categories and you were already learning them or your trainees were already learning them so that they could pass a temporary permit. Uh, when you were doing your in-house training and you were teaching them how to do a walk around inspection, you were already doing all of these things. When you were teaching maneuverability, when you were teaching them on the road and talking to them about you know, the real life skills of operating this vehicle and giving them time to, to actually go out and drive down the road, you were already covering these things, hopefully. But what they've done is they have, they have listed out this curriculum to help guide us through these things to make sure that we're doing it every single time with every single trainee. And that's, that's the important piece to take away. So with behind the wheel on the range, you'll see the exact same things are listed that we were previously already teaching. With the behind the wheel on public road, you'll see the exact same things, uh, items that you go out and have these conversations about. Um, so you have an operator that you're traveling down a road and you're, you're taking them through each one of these, these identified areas, just as Victoria had also spoke about. And with each one of these different training areas, um, as Victoria shared, there are no minimum instruction hours that are required uh, for the training, but we as instructors or whoever our trainers are, whoever our instructors are in-house, um, they must cover these areas that have been identified. They must meet or exceed the curriculum, and they also must keep track of the hours of training that, that's taken place for the trainees. Once you've completed the training regimen or the curriculum uh, for your trainees, you will then be able to go in and log back into your portal through ELDT, and then you will start to go through the process of plugging in all the information from their scores or their time that they had, the hours of training. Uh, things as, such as their driver's license number, the issuing state, the date of birth, first name, last name, and then you're also going to put in the training location and the type of training that, that had taken place. Now with these with this data that you have to input, you're going to do this three separate times. So as you put the information in for, you know, operator John Doe, you're going to go in and you're going to put in theory and you're going to record the theory score. This needs to also be completed as soon as possible after the theory portion is completed. And then once the trainee has completed the behind the wheel range and the behind the wheel public road, you will then go back in on two more times to input this information as well. And then you will tabulate how many hours of training that this particular uh, trainee was able to spend in the, in the vehicle. Once all of these things have been submitted, everything's been put into the ELDT, um, you can then call your local Bureau of Motor Vehicles, uh, the testing site that you would typically utilize and then be able to schedule a test for that trainee so that they can be legally licensed in the state to drive. Um, and also, as Victoria was, was mentioning in her portion of the uh, presentation, remember to maintain training records. It's documentation, documentation, documentation. So previous to those things that we have now learned that Clear Roads has made available to us, um, I had actually went through with, with our training um, training manual here in the city of Dublin and created my own manual so that we could be able to keep up with our own documentation. And basically I took from the ELDT was the importance of the standardized training and that we must always meet or exceed those training items that they've identified for us. 
So what I did is I went in and I basically took their information that I previously showed you on the last couple of slides, and I copied that and turned that into a document that our training uh, folks here in the city could go through and be able to keep track of everything that they need to be training with every trainee, as well as the hours of training. Uh, this particular document that we have, if anybody is interested in util utilizing it, um, I have it saved in a Word format. Uh, you can contact me after the presentation and I can send that to you and you can then rebrand it to your community. Uh, but again, as we've said several times previously, utilize the assets or the, the items that LTAP has prov provided for us as well as the clear roads. So this just shows the rest of the manual, <clears throat> rest of the manual that we have for the behind the wheel range and the behind the wheel road, um, public road portion. All right, well, that brings me to the end of my portion of the presentation. So before we move into questions, I'll have Victoria kind of go through and see if any of any of those items I shared uh, raise some questions with all of you. I would like to put a plug in for Ohio APWA. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to take advantage of the items that the Ohio APWA offers as well. Um, here is a link to the website. Uh, going to the front page, there is a lot of information that is that is available for everyone to be able to use, and we definitely encourage membership. Um, so if you're not already a member of the APWA, definitely look into doing that or reach out to your local communities who already are um, with any questions that you may have. Um, there's a lot of current news and opportunities that are available. Uh, you can reach out to the branches. There's a branches tab so you can see what county you're in uh, so that you'll know who to contact. Uh, lots of events are going on all the time statewide. Uh, some of these events are learning and development events. They're also social outings. Um, so you can get out and you can network with some of the others that are in, you know, in your career field. Lots of leadership opportunities and information just in general about APWA at the state level, and there's also the APWA at the national level. So definitely we encourage this, and I hope to, hope to meet some of you in the near future uh, with our Central Ohio APWA. So Victoria, I think with that, we turn it back to you. Thanks, Gary. I'm gonna go ahead and take the um, control back on the mouse here. So we did have a couple of uh, questions that came in. I'm going to read those off while I put the question up that we have, the last Mentimeter question for everybody. Um, question that came in for you is, do you complete the entry for the city of Dublin or do your instructors? Okay, so I'm reading this again. What roadblocks you see yeah. setting up your... Oh, that's the, the yeah, that's the question I'm asking them to admit respond to on Menti, but we had one that came in in the question box. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and I think you kind of answered this already, but they want to know, do you complete the entry for the city of Dublin or do your instructors? So here in the city of Dublin, I, I will create that. So the document that we've created here, I send that out with whoever's doing the training. Uh, the trainers, they keep track of everything. And then at the close of the training, they bring the document back to me. I then input it into ELDT, and then I'm also the one that's taking care of scheduling the test with the local testing site. So you can, if you want, don't want to have that, I guess maybe that responsibility or just that extra task that you have to do, uh, you can assign other users to your training portal uh, to be able to assist in that. But with the amount of folks that we are training here, you know, throughout the year, I just go ahead and never see it all for the city of Dublin. Great, thank you. And there was a question um, that came in, and I think it's um, more for me on, they wanna know, does ODOT complete the theory part if we have our employees go through LTAP? Um, and this question, I'm gonna answer it two different ways. If, if you are an ODOT employee who has employees that you're gonna, need to have trained, I would say if you, you need to reach out to Doug McLaughlin in our training office because internally ODOT has its own process and we're using the same um, modules, but they're in the internal ODOT system as well. 
So if you are external to ODOT um, and you're going to have your employees complete theory through LTAP, then we through LTAP will be uploading that to the Federal Motor Carriers Registry. So um, you don't have to worry about it once they go through the theory training. I'll pull the information down um, once they pass the test and I'll upload it and it'll be out there. So another one that came into the question box and then I'll switch over to um, what's coming in on the screen is there was a FYI put in and I take it that this person um, is someone who is involved with the CDL testing for the state of Ohio. They said just an FYI come this fall and this is projected time the state of Ohio is going to be changing the skills portion of the CDL test the straight line offset parallel and alley dock however um, we still have to teach them to satisfy the ELDT and, that, and that's correct I mean for the federal motor carrier purposes we've got to follow the curriculum that was set out um, but if there are changes, like you're saying, that are coming this fall for what the state's going to be testing, we'll make sure to put some information out there for everybody so they can be aware and also incorporate that into um, their range and road portions so they can make sure that they pass when they get there. Um, let's see. Another question that came in, if you set up your Federal Motor Carrier's account to do your own theory, can you change it to use the LTAP theory? Sure, you can just, you know, have them complete the theory through LTAP and then um, we'll upload the information um, and you should be able to see it. If you can't see it, then, you know, we can work on contacting Federal Motor Carriers to make sure that they make it so in your account that you can see that information. Um, Okay. I think that's a good good Go question for the that was just answered. If there's a opportunity that you may go back and forth, if you know it's a time of year and you're able to provide your own theory training mm -hmm. and it just lines out that way for you, when you set up on the ELDT, you can still set up that you're going to provide all three, but ultimately the training that you are delivering, you know, to your trainees as long as it's meeting or exceeding and LTAP is obviously going to exceed it. Um, so definitely you could go back and forth if you had to. And then with the manual that I've created, I think it's important to, to list or footnote exactly what your resources are that you are utilizing for all of your training program. So if it's the state of Ohio manual, if it's ELDT guidelines, if it's LTAP theory, um, if you have private manuals, like we have uh, a manual called CTTS here, um, all of those things just document that in your training so that it's standardized and it's offered the same every time. That's great. Thank you. Um, we did have somebody who had mentioned in the question box that they said they had to trust that the employee correctly went through the LTAP theory because they couldn't see it on the Federal Motor Carrier site and they had to call the testing center for verification. Um, I would think if they set up an account, you know, then it would allow them to be able to see it. So they didn't actually, you know, if you're not planning on offering the behind the wheel, I would imagine you could still set the account up so you could see it. You would just need to list yourself as a provider, but you wouldn't actually then um, be putting anything into the system. What do you think, Gary? Yeah, I would, I would agree. Okay. You know that or you can always call me, drop me an email. I'm happy to work with you to get you the information. Um, let's see, other questions that came in. Um, you know, getting set up as a training provider is a challenge that you see and getting training materials organized. Um, yeah, I, you know, if you need help with getting the training materials organized or getting set up as a training provider, our contact information is going to be on the next screen. We're happy to help you with those things. Um, that's not an issue. Oh, the person who we just said that they couldn't see the LTAP theory said that they are already set up and they can see all the behind the wheel that they enter. So, you know what, Eric? contact me after this webinar. I bet you're having the same issue the city of Toledo did because they could see all their behind the wheel, but they couldn't see our theory. And I'll um, work with you and we'll contact some of Fair Motor Carriers to hopefully get your account fixed so you can see that. Um, another challenge, or I guess um, 
a thing that they saw in there was that now that they know if they have someone on staff with a CDL license for two years or more that um, that they have the trainers that they need. Yeah, I mean, that's something you'll have to talk to them about. And, you know, hopefully they're comfortable with doing the training because you definitely don't want to, you know, force somebody to be a trainer that doesn't want to be because that's not a good experience for um, anybody. But, um, you know, we're happy to help you, you know, look at what requirements, you know, you would want to have for someone who's going to be a trainer um, because we want to make certain that, you know, everybody has a great experience with this. And that's our background is doing training. So another person said cooperation from their collective bargaining unit. You know, I would hope that, you know, the collective bargaining unit, the, the union would be on board with ho helping to get people trained to, you know, fill the positions because, you know, once the positions are filled, they're going to have hopefully more members too. So, you know, we're all trying to make sure that we have enough folks to do the, the work that's out there. So hopefully that you can do a collaborative effort on this. Um, you know, I heard a phrase a long time ago on one of the union contracts was being negotiated called interest-based bargaining. So, and that was where you start from the perspective of these are our common interests and, you know, have the discussion that way. So IBB is what they called it for short. So hopefully that's something you can focus on. Um, one challenge they said, I have a little CDL knowledge and assume I'll get lots of questions from employees. You know, the resources that Gary has shared with you are great. And again, you know, he talked about the value of networking with colleagues, and I would definitely encourage you. I mean, we've had lots of people here on the um, webinar, but, you know, get to know others and reach out and, you know, your knowledge base will grow. You're, we don't all know everything, but we know people that know the answers. So, you know, just continue to grow your group of colleagues, and I'm sure that they can help you out. Um, Maybe this is one, Gary, you can answer. Would you recommend a specific pre-trip checklist for training? I think as far as pre-trip for training, it's gonna go back to when you were sharing, Victoria, when you were sharing that whatever truck they are training in is the truck that they need to test in. Um, different models are gonna vary. Yes, some of the, some of the you know, absolute things are going to be the same, you know, as far as compressors and brakes and the engine and, you know, lights and so forth. But what changes is every make and model, there are little inconsistencies where maybe an air compressor is on the driver's side on one truck, but it's on a passenger side on something else. So whoever's going to do that training, you know, work with them to put together your own walk around inspection check sheet, if you will, so that as you're teaching the trainees, to be able to go around that vehicle, class A or class B, um, you will have your manual or your training uh, walk around sheet set for that particular vehicle um, because it, it literally does change here at the city of Dublin. We have a couple of different large truck makes um, and depending on the truck that we go out to, there are some changes. Um, and unless you are a seasoned CDL driver that you've done a lot of walk arounds you're not gonna catch that right off. So for your new folks, pick one truck, train on that truck, build your walk around sheet, buy that within, you know, in-house. And then, you know, from there to use that truck for your actual testing site. If you're looking for something that's just kind of a blanket um, guide, clear roads again, you know, you can utilize some of those things. The items that ELDT list that I shared with the walk around, um, you know, you can kind of pull, pick and pull some stuff from there to try to build a training sheet, but nothing is going to surpass the knowledge of your current employees um, who have the, the trucks that can help you build that sheet based on your equipment that you own. Great. And there was a comment that came in um, from mm -hmm. Joe Randolph in the box that I went ahead and shared out with everybody, too. He's also the person who made the mention about the changes coming this fall. Um, and. I want to mention too that, you know, Gary's right on with that. Um, 
we are working through LTAP on building, and I'll give you guys a little preview, some um, heavy equipment training modules that can be used in a, a mentorship program, meaning you, they can, new heavy equipment trainers, operators can do these modules, but then be paired with somebody in the field to do the hands-on portion. And the modules that are coming cover that, exactly what Gary was talking about. They talk about how you can have a base form, but you need to modify it to the equipment you're using, and that you also, you can look at the what the manufacturer has provided um, you know hopefully they've provided a sample pre-trip inspection form as well so when we follow up today um, I will pull out a copy of the EM 78 which is the um, pre-trip general pre-trip inspection form that ODOT has and send it out to everybody as well um, but hopefully that'll um, help you out Let's see some more comments or questions that's come in. Um, somebody said if they use the LTAP theory but don't do their behind the wheel in-house, where would they find behind the wheel training? You know, I would look to local career centers. There are tons of um, providers of CDL training out there as well. Um, and we're going to actually have a, we're planning for a follow-up webinar on this topic that's going to be more of a panel discussion of different jurisdictions who have done this um, here in about a month or a month and a half. So, you know, that's also one of the topics I know we're going to be talking about is um, where to find that behind the wheel training. So stay tuned. Hopefully we'll get you some answers there. Um, Somebody else commented, Get a training, getting training started and finished in a timely manner based on our city employment requirement of six months to obtain a CDL. Yeah, I could see that as being a, a roadblock or a challenge, definitely. And we can also um, ask the presenters in the next webinar to follow up on that question, too. It says, at the completion of training, what type of testing location is required? Gary, can you take that one? So at the completion of training, what type of testing location is required? Um, I don't know exactly how to answer that perfectly. I would say it's probably going to be based on where you're located from. If there is a third party uh, training provider in your area that is able to, you know, book your appointment, we utilize one here in Columbus um, that is not a state highway patrol run facility. It's a secondary or a third party um, facility and that works just fine because they are already set up on their own as a provider. Um, they can then go into the ELDT. They're going to see your scores. They're going to see your data that you have inputted in for that trainee. They will then go ahead and move forward with creating the appointment, providing the test. And then if the trainee provides, I'm sorry, if the trainee passes the test, then they go ahead and put it in on their end so that it shows up at the BMV and they can purchase their new license. Um, so I, I would say look out to the area, you know, look within the area that you're located and see if there are, um, you know, different training places that are provided rather Ohio State Patrol ran or if it's something that's a privately ran facility. Great. Thank you for taking that question. And um, we did have a, a follow up in the chat, which I shared with everybody from Joe Randolph. He wanted to make a clarification on the um, comment that he'd made. We've also had another person that offered to share their pre trip study guide. So, Connor, I've mentioned that if you just email it to us, I'll make sure to share it with everybody on this webinar. We appreciate you sharing that. So, all right, I'm going to go on to the, the last slide here because the comments have quit coming in on the Mentimeter, but um, there's our contact information. So please reach out. Uh, we really appreciate everybody's time on this webinar, and I want to give Gary a great big thank you, because I know that this isn't normally part of his J job to be uh, presenting on webinars. So you've done a fantastic job. So we sincerely appreciate all your help with this and being, uh, you know, a person who's boots on the ground doing the, the actual thing we're talking about really helps other folks um, tremendously to be able to then see that, you know, one of their own colleagues is doing this. So thank you so much, Gary. Thank you. So, all right. Well, if anyone has follow-up questions, would like more information, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll get a follow-up email sent out with the answer to the one question um, that was asked concerning the Class A 
upgrade and then also the additional resources that have been promised. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.